all of you all? I think the fire chat session uh, kind of really helped me up, uh, kind of avoid the, uh, you know, the graveyard shift. So thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm here to talk about a very important topic, but as I stand here to talk, I think uh, fascinating to sit there and listen to some of these distinguished speakers. So uh, thank you so much for that, and thanks ED team for giving me the opportunity here. Interesting topic, uh, facing a talent crisis. Uh, how many of you are people managers here who manage people? A quick show of hands. Okay, so that's pretty much everybody. And therefore, I think I should be able to add some value there. So this is something I'm sure you've gone through in the past or currently going through. And the fact remains, you know, it is definitely a problem. Huge topic, but I'll try and do justice to fix it into the 15 minutes I've been allotted. And uh, I've already got those peer pressure built in, uh, you know, in terms of following schedules. Um, so let me start with rejigging your brains here. Uh, what you see here is, is a Ferrari engine. Yeah, so this is an engine of a, a Ferrari 599 GT turbo engine. It weighs about 80 odd kgs, but packs in a power of 6,000 cc's, takes the Ferrari car from zero to you know, 100 kilometers in just 3.2 seconds, and tops about 330 kilometers per hour. Right, interesting statistics for something which is so small, but carries something which is about 1,800 odd kgs, right? And I think for the you know, service industry and surely for the life insurance or the general insurance space, you know, people are this engine. You agree with that? So I think, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we've got regulations, we've got technologies, we've got capital, I think people make a huge difference. And in an industry like ours, which is just getting out of the teens, this plays a huge role. We've heard people talk about uh, insurance penetration. You know, we really haven't done much, you know, this, this you know, uh, close to two decades of uh, privatization, but yet we are re really haven't kind of, you know, done the penetration level that you see in the, you know, developed economies. Would it be safe to say that the insurance penetration is directly proportional to the talent you have? And when I say talent, it's both in terms of number of people and also the quality of people. And I would hazard a guess is certainly that the talent you have in this, in this country will surely determine how well you do it. Now let me give you some interesting numbers. What we have today is about uh, you know, close to 2.2 million odd agents across the country uh, and about three lakh odd direct employees which are part of the insurance companies you know, doing multiple roles. And if you take a CAGR of the last 10 years when you know, we had multiple insurance companies come into the picture, what you see is our premium has definitely grown by about 9% on a CAGR basis, okay? But what's interesting is it's come on the back of a degrowth in the number of agents and there's also a degrowth in the, in the insurance penetration. Now, if I were to take the direct employees, it's largely the same. While the number of insurance companies have grown, the direct employees remain largely flat, which means clearly the number of people required to fuel this is really not there, you know, in terms of covering the potential and, you know, the, the, the ask in the industry in terms of either penetration or the density. Now, why is that? So if you look at most of the industries and most of you would relate that in the last you know, 10 or 15 years that you've been a part of the insurance company, the age of your employees have gone down, right? And uh, in the early session, we spoke about how do we look at insurance plans for the millennials. So clearly we are in the era of millennials, whether you like it or not, you know, be it from the customer side or even from the employee side. So the going forward, as we get the insurance industry get into its, uh, you know, into the adulthood, as, as Vishy mentioned, I think what's gonna fuel this industry is gonna be the millennials. I want to stop by and give you a very interesting perspective about this generation, right? Uh, so I'm not talking about the first generation, which is called the silent generations, which is the people from the, you know, less than, you know, 45 uh, born era. We've got the baby boomers who are between the 45 to 65, uh, different theories in terms of dates, but largely the 40s and 60s are your baby boomers. Uh, Gen X, you know, largely people who established the insurance industry here are the Gen X, you know, part of here as well, 60s to 80s. And of course, we've got the millennials right now, which are people born post the you know, 80s to 90s. It's now the era of the Gen Zs, which is people born post 95, I'm sure. They'll soon get into the industry as well. Now, the idea is not showing you know, the breakup of the generation or the cohort of the, of the audience here, but it's the way they behave. If you look at the baby boomers, they pretty much believed in having one career in the lifetime. So if I were to look at my parents, and I'm sure most of your parents, they you know, joined a particular organization, worked in the same stream, they pretty much had one career in their lifetime. Gen X, a little different. They wanted to have one career, but they wanted multiple jobs. So either they stick to insurance and do multiple companies, or they work in the same company with multiple roles, 
right? So they do have one career, but multiple jobs. But what we're dealing with now, and, and that's going to be the talent for us, you know, going forward, is the millennials where they believe in having multiple careers, multiple jobs, right? And therefore that gives you a different predicament in terms of what you need to be managing. Here's interesting, what's the challenges when you work with millennials? Uh, so we as an insurance company, you know, we've grown about 10 times in our manpower in the last about five odd years, right? So obviously the chunk of the people that's coming into the organization to fuel our growth are the millennials. And some of the challenges we foresee on, and we're kind of facing rather are this. I think we just spoke about uh, in the session earlier that the industry doesn't seem to have a very positive outlook image. And I think someone said, I don't, you know, talk about very flashy when I join an you know, insurance company. You know, one of the surveys said, insurance industry is not sexy enough, if I can use that word, but that's what the you know, millennials say. 80% uh, of millennials don't believe that they can see insurance as a career path, right? Uh, sad but true. Uh, and of course, there's low level of interest in the insurance industry. So because when you look at you know, people, uh, you know, talent, they've got multiple options in terms of where they can actually build a career. And of course, people don't want to stick for long. Uh, they don't look at stability in the jobs. 12 to 18 months is what they are, you know, they, they're happy with in terms of looking at the job and then quickly moving on to a different job. So that's the challenge we face. And to understand this further, I think it's important to understand what is it you know, that drives the millennials. So a very interesting study done by uh, Deloitte in 2019, the millennial survey, spoke about this. What are the top five aspirations for a, for a millennial? Number one is not stability in job, etc. The number one is to experience life, is to travel around the world, right? That's the number one priority. And of course, you have things like I need money, I need to kind of have stability. So number four is very important when you look at it, that they want to contribute to the economy, they want to contribute to the society they're part of. Very interesting. So I want to do stuff for myself, but I also want to contribute. Very interesting, you know, perspective that they, they have. I don't know how many of you have heard of the gig economy, but essentially a gig economy is one where people would want to work part-time, would want to work on a short-term basis, on a contractual basis, very prevalent in the software industry that I take a project and move on to the different you know, in the companies. Now, gig economy, it seems to be a very interesting proposition for the millennial, where 84% believe I can work there, I would love to work there. And the reason for that is, I want to work at the time that I want to work. Right? Of course, it gives me money, but I, it gives me a lot of flexibility, and I want to do stuff that, you know, that ideally a normal 8 to 5, 8 to 6 job wouldn't, which means they would want to balance out work life very, very well. So that's the, the beast we're talking about. That's the nature of the beast we're dealing with as well. So if you look at the talent market, quickly running into, you know, what are the four segments which really determine our talent market today? One is the feeder system that we have, which is from where I get my resources or get my talent. Then they move on to the market, which is where they work, the work environment. And the last two is, of course, people related, which is the managers and the individual per se, right? I'll touch upon the top two, which is the feeder market and the, the feeder system and the, the work environment. Now, that's what it is. Now, if you look at the feeder system, for someone to look at having insurance as a career, and like you saw earlier, they don't believe it so. The reason for that is when you come into, you know, into an education system, they do not see this as a career option. Now, if I take engineers, if I take software, if I take architecture, if I take medicals, there's a clear stream that I study this, I can look at this as a career option. I don't have it here. And we are talking about industry which is, you know, which is pretty much going to take care of your entire economy in some fashion or size. And therefore, what happens is from a selling point of view, which is about 75, 80% of the entire talent of an organization, I need to depend on people who have selling skills, not necessarily financial planning, sales skills, or, or, or insurance skills, but I rely heavily on the selling aspect of it. If you look at the work environment, um, high demand in terms of ensuring results and therefore monetary driven, it's really, really, you know, dependent on what I can offer to the person in terms of incentives and rewards, and that becomes the, the economy. Uh, I think sometime back, uh, you know, Mr. Anthony spoke about the fact that we don't spend enough in terms of training. Very, very true fact that, you know, there's limited patience that many of the organizations have shown in terms of training their individual to see this as a career option. Uh, needless to say, there's attrition and there's pressures and then therefore people move on. So what can a, an organization or what can you guys possibly do? Uh, I would simply recommend something called the TRP model, uh, as in any television shows, the higher the TRP, you know, higher successful or higher you know, profitability for you. So simply put, TRP is nothing but the training, the recognition, and the purpose that you would want to bring to the table when you deal with such talent, right? Quickly touching upon what training is all about, and this is a, a question most of you know, people ask because training does come with a cost, and they say, what if I train a person and he leaves? Well, the question to ask is, what if I don't train and they stay back? Yeah, 
So when I look at training, I think, you know, essentially you need to look at, you know, three, four aspects to it. Uh, one is definitely in terms of the number of man days or man hours you'd want to spend with the person there. Uh, two, on a regular basis, look at what is the impact of the return of investment that your training session has done with the person. And of course, the content, is it, is it you know, specified? Is it you know, personalized to the individual there? Is it need-based on a training content? And last but not least, I think using technology. I think today, most of the training that you know, we can look at doing is through gamification. If your millennial spends about you know, four to five hours on a day on a smartphone, I'm sure you can use the same smartphone to ensure and some amount of education can be imparted through. So some ways of looking at how training can be you know, used, but this is an absolutely critical you know, mode for us to drive. They say recognition the greatest motivator. Let's figure out why. So if you look at recognition, I think a um, lot of studies have shown, I'm not to run through this for want of time, a lot of studies have shown when you speak to employees, what matters is appreciation. And the moment a person feels appreciated, he feels belonging to that organization, he feels trusted. If he feels trusted, needless to say, he's going to commit his time and effort into the organization and he's going to be a valuable resource and could possibly stick longer. Okay, so what, what do you do with recognition? I think simply it has to be multidimensional. It's got to be timely and it's got to be regular, right? So there were organizations which says, you know, if you're doing a good job in the month of April, don't worry, I'll recognize you by the end of the year. I'm sorry, I don't think people are patient to wait for the end of the year. They need instant gratification. And I think recognition comes cheap. You know, you can always find your means and means of getting recognition out there. The other interesting study which says, says that I, I need to be recognized not only for my results, but also my efforts, and a lot of companies don't do that. So I think if you start recognizing the efforts of what people are done, they feel appreciated and you know, they tend to fall back, fall into the right track as well. So that's the, the importance of recognition there. Purpose, I think a very aptly put saying purpose will actually unlock access to talent. Uh, it reminds me of the story of uh, John F. Kennedy walking into NASA, and uh, you know, he looks up a janitor who's kind of sweeping the floor, and he asks him, what are you doing? And the janitor just holds the broom and says, sir, I'm working towards putting a man on the moon. Right? So that's purpose. So he knows, you know, whatever bit I'm doing, there's a larger cost, the larger purpose that he's, you know, handling with. I think that's what, you know, uh, you know people are looking at here, particularly with millennials. And one of the study by NY shows that they're three times more likely to work in an organization with a strong purpose than a company which is profit-driven. Right? And um, I think I can, I can just stop here and say, when people are dealing with life insurance or you know, health insurance, general insurance, like Tuppen showed a little earlier, I don't think there can be a better and larger purpose than what we guys are doing. You know, our moment of truth is pretty much you know, every, every 30 seconds, is that what I was told earlier? Every 30 seconds is a moment of truth and there can't be a, a larger you know, a moment, a purpose that we can actually drive our new talents into this industry. Skip this with for one of data. So essentially, just to summarize in terms of what we can do, I think there are five specific areas. One is to definitely build a lot of flexibility into the organization. I think that's critical. This is the need of the hour. People want to you know, look at something beyond work as well, not just you know, uh, working at the time that you say, but whenever they want to work. Two, counseling. Uh, pretty young generations, you know, impatient or you know, whatever you'd want to call it, but the fact remains that they need support. Uh, and, and this is not just professional counseling. They would need counseling on the personal front, on the education front, maybe in terms of passions and hobbies that they want to drive. So counseling becomes another critical area that every organization would possibly need to invest in. What are you doing in terms of creating a work experience? And I think, uh, you know, I'll simply put that your organization should reflect the, the society at large or the customer base that you're dealing with. So it should be a reflection of it and therefore create an experience. The last two things that an organization can do, very, very important ones, one is to build a brand. I think, will, will the person working for the organization carry that badge with a lot of pride and say belong to the organization? And is the company doing enough to build in that particular brand for the, company to, for the employees to feel good about it, right? Uh, word of mouth, uh, you know, you know, is very important. You know, will your employee refer one of his friends or families into the organization? If he does so, then I think you've done a good job in terms of building an image. And that's important for, for these people. And the last is, of course, in terms of embracing technology. You can't get away with it. We you know, spoke about AIs and MIs, MLs of the world, but you've got to embrace technology. What was done you know, in the 80s and 90s will not work right now. And for me, I simply put it, technology should basically empower you, enable you, and motivate the person out there. My last slide, and hopefully I'm sticking to my schedule here, uh, is in terms of what the future looks like. Okay, and the future looks like a beautiful blend of uh, talent and machine or you know, man and technology. 
And uh, an interesting study by, done by BCG spoke about what are the three competitive advantage any organization can have. Okay, one is the privilege zone, which is an area that you can do better than others can't, right? And for which you definitely need a lot of talented workforce and supporting them will be technology. Two, how good are you learning and you know, improvising those aspects, which is exploration and you know, exploitation of what you've done. Again, you need the people to do that for you and you know, what, what, uh, what systems can help you in doing that. And last, you know, in terms of flexibility, the game changes every minute and how flexible, how agile are you to ensure that you're still in the game makes a difference for which you need people to support you and strong systems in the back end, be it AI, be it machine learning, to make that happen for you. So quick, uh, you know, in terms of food for thought for people sitting here, in terms of what you need to be doing to ensure your engine keeps driving up and you're clocking at 330 kilometers per hour and ahead of your competition. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful uh, talking to you and you've been a very patient uh, audience. Thank you once again, ET Edge, and uh, have a fantastic evening and God bless. Thank you.